Connor took it and... Okay, welcome to the second of the Digital Security by Design Roadshows, a series of four events around the UK exploring the journey to a more secure future. In the first event at Bletchley Park, we looked at the history of computing and how the drive for more performance led to aspects of security being overlooked. Today's speakers will take us to the next step in the story, exploring the world of cybersecurity today and the new technologies in security, in cybersecurity. The series of ev ev events, start again, the series of events is part of the Digital Security by Design, or DSBD, uh, initiative to make computer systems architecture more secure by design. 
Its aim is to radically update the foundation of insecure digital computing infrastructure today by creating a more secure hardware and software ecosystem. We'll hear more about that uh, when Simon Moore uh, talks about Cherry. Built on new security capabilities, the initiative hopes that the technologies developed will underpin future digital products and services. Today, we'll start with Professor Daniel Dresner, who will explore the world of cybersecurity. And then Paul Waller, who will be, uh, via a recorded presentation, look at fixing the foundations for security. Then we'll hear from Professor Simon Moore, who will tell us about Cherry, which is a new hardware technology that mitigates software security vulnerab vulnerabilities. Try saying that. Finally, Jude McCorrie will provide her perspective on cybersecurity, and especially as she's deep into what's happening at Cyber Scotland this week. So before that, we're just going to um, give you a little bit of uh, a snapshot of what we did in the first event, um, which was at Bletchley Park uh, last week, uh, the history of computers, last week or the week before. We're here today at Bletchley Park, uh, the National Museum of Computing. What we're doing is looking at the history of computing, then we can uh, better understand how to create more trusted computers in the future. Contrast between this piece of kit and the Turing machine, it could not be more extreme. I mean, I don't think that he had any idea in his mind that the future might be formed of a sort of fusion between these two concepts. We had one big trouble with trying to do digital security by design in 1975. We didn't have enough transistors. We've heard from a lot of really interesting speakers. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot. But I had no idea about how computing started and the different kinds of innovations that have happened over the last 50 years or so. The Digital Security by Design Technology Access Program is your opportunity to get involved and experiment with this technology. The initiative hopes that the technology is developed will underpin future digital products and services. The full potential of, of DSBD, including issues such as use cases, uh, socio-technical impacts, um, to say nothing of the regulatory frameworks that are likely to accompany its adoption, these are all situated in volatile, uncertain and unknown future. The UK can be a leader in this place. Our national cyber strategy 2022 is to make the UK into a leading global cyber power. It's been a really interesting day today and I can't wait for the next event at Glasgow. So you see, um, that was uh, trying to go over the history. Uh, so now we're going to look at the technologies. And here's the agenda today. Um, we'll start off with Daniel Dresner and Paul Waller and Simon Moore and then Jude McCorry. Um, before we um, go to Professor uh, uh, Daniel, or Danny Dresner, as he's uh, talked about, he's Professor of Cybersecurity at the University of Manchester. He's the first Professor of Cybersecurity at the University of Manchester, which he joined after 22 years with the Nas National Computing Centre. He's also the founder and director of the IASME Consortium, which champions cybersecurity for small businesses and runs the UK's Cyber Essentials Scheme, and furthers the which furthers the opportunities for cybersecurity uh, for SMEs as part of the Four University Greater Manchester Cybersecurity Foundry, Cyber Foundry. Danny also revived the Ratio Club, a thought leadership group, 
for cybernetics, in which Alan Turing uh, participated once. Danny contributes to books, conferences, and appears on the BBC explaining cybersecurity risks to the wider community. He was voted second to, uh, top cybersecurity influencer in the UK 2017 and 11th worldwide in 2019 and 2020. Fascinating guy. We had a great chat earlier. Uh, Danny, over to you. Don't know who, I don't know who wrote that bio, but I'm going to have to impress now, aren't I? My goodness. And perhaps most important, stick to time. Stick to time. Right. Is my slide up there? No. I'm going to press the green button. It worked. Fantastic. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I've been asked to talk today about the world of cybersecurity. I'm just wondering whether I'm out of date already and I ought to be talking about the metaverse of cybersecurity. Uh, perhaps we'll, uh, we'll get there. I'm going to try and merge some of the concepts. I'll give you a quick a crash course. Um, I'll, uh, there's a couple of slides, um, biographical slides as well. Uh, in the words of CJ, I'll tell you how I got to where I am today because it's very relevant uh, how I sort of don't usually follow um, on the, the conventional path. Uh, and I like to draw, uh, join dots. Joining dots is just really important in this because we tend to have this swing between trying to solve people related problems and technology related problems. And if it was that simple, perhaps we wouldn't be where we are today. And I've also got to be a little bit academic, so I've got a couple of graphs as well. So perhaps most importantly on the agenda, I would like people to come away realizing that this cybersecurity thing is not some huge scary thing full of fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which is usually what people shout about when they try to sell you things to fix the problem but it's actually a really positive opportunity for moving forward for the future. And that already we've got a lot of things which work really well, and very important things as well. So, first graph of the day, see if you can follow this. Some of the issues that we've faced. Um, nice local Manchester story on Northwest tonight because it was a Salford couple putting software onto people's computers to steal their banking details. Uh, Ashley Madison, the big Ashley Madison stealing of data. Who's got an Ashley Madison account? Uh, I'm not sure whether people are amused by the question or that's just a guilty giggle. Mm. Oh, well, we'll have words you have. Never quite sure whether the pink paisley cravat was a good fashion statement that day, but never mind, let's move on. Um, talk, talk. Yeah, I, I, have, I have great, great uh, respect for Baroness Harding. She has really contributed to my TV career, so thank you for that. Um, all kinds of stories about what the Russians may do, might be do, might do. It may or may not interest you to know that, you know, well, f firstly, why do I end up on TV a lot? You know, is it the good looks? Uh, is it the brains? No, it's because, uh, firstly, I don't charge, and, of course, the studios are just around the, down the road from Manchester University. So you've got to, you know, look at the facts, be uh, that facts behind this. And interestingly enough, when it comes to cybersecurity and what may go on, I probably turn down far more interview opportunities uh, than uh, I actually, actually take up. Uh, um, that was an interesting one. It wasn't the, you know, the huge stealing of people's data. And it's also very important that we shouldn't get too hung up about data and data protection. It's about protecting people. Uh, and this was a time where uh, criminals had got software onto British Airways systems. And as people were putting their credit card de details in, the criminals were taking them out again. Um, and it, you know, when it comes to security, we're interested in three things. Confidentiality, of course, I mean, we know all about that. It's all about encryption, data protection, isn't it? But we forget, also, we want that information to be correct. Uh, we actually want our pensions or whatever it might be processed correctly. We also want to make sure that that valve which controls the chemicals in that water treatment plant is going to close and open at the right time. So we need to think about those things as well. Anybody notice a trend? Anybody notice a trend? You know, like I said, a bit of a graph here. There's a trend here. What's the trend in cybersecurity? Very personal trend. Anyone want to guess? No, too early in the morning. Okay, I'll answer it for you. 
Uh, so there we are, there we are, a little bit of a link to, uh, to last week. My mate Stuart says, always put up a picture of a towering intellect, um, but I thought you might like to see the statue of Alan Turing in, the, in Manchester city centre as well. So, that, so, that, so there we go. I have given up trying to keep this slide up to date. Every day, every few days, every news site that you can think of, there is some type of cybersecurity disaster uh, which crops up and it's always bigger than the last one. More information, more data, more personal data has been leaked. And this goes all the way through from just kind of the data protection side of stuff to the kind of faults and errors in devices, cars, which can be run off the road because of we expect some kind of connectivity, connectivity to the internet, allows some kind of remote control, the remote control gets taken over by the wrong kind of people, and next thing you know, bad things are happening. Um, poor far car phone warehouse, uh, responsible for all of those telephone services and customer services and lots of data, they've been hit so many times. I thought I'd do a little bit of research so I could actually give you sort of a league table of how many times that they had been subject to criminal activities. So I went into the search engine of my choice, uh, probably other people's choices as well, um, put in car phone, data, uh, car phone warehouse data leak and this was the result. I don't actually think that that's what was intended, but hmm, interesting. So bad stuff happens, bad stuff happens. Uh, benchmark in perhaps the public understanding of cyber security came when the WannaCry uh, attack, we always use these really uh, you know, exciting names, cyber attacks, when w the WannaCry attack on the NHS, it wasn't an attack on the NHS, it's just the NHS was vulnerable, they had their cyber doors open. And this is one of the real problems that we have with cyber security, that we immediately try to find whose fault it is. So what do we start saying? Oh, it was definitely China, look at the ransom note. And actually one of my colleagues, this is the great thing, I. One of my other titles at the university, the job which is kind of across all the various disciplines, I asked for a job title which neither sounded silly and would fit on a business card, so they printed it very small. But as an academic coordinator for cybersecurity, I get to speak with the engineers and the psychologists, but also the forensic linguists. So my colleague, the forensic linguist, can look at the ransom note and say, ah, that's how a North Korean would write English uh, to make you think it was a Chinese person writing English in the style of a North Korean writing it. You might want to make notes. Who else do we um, make a fuss of? Oh, yeah, it was the end users. If only they hadn't clicked. If only they hadn't clicked on that. They should have known it was a fraud. Well, should they? What else is on the list? Oh, yeah, definitely government funding. Yeah, we're not given enough money. We don't get to update our machines. Our te technology's old and all kinds of problems. Give us some more money. To be fair, we got that relationship with the, um, the manufacturers as well. We bought it because they were offering it cheap, and that's nice. We never thought of actually, should we actually have a deal about keeping it up to date and putting some longevity into it? Oh, yeah, definitely IT's problem. And this is, isn't it? I mean, how many people look at their, um, their computers and devices and think, well, you know, IT will sort it out? Um, my son works for a small accountancy firm. And he says he, does, he divides his users up into two categories. Uh, those who are too scared to use the technology and those who just keep clicking until th things keep working. Who else have we got? Oh, yes, well, kind of the NHS. Well, it's just too complex. We can't possibly keep that up to date. We can't protect that. Uh, and it was probably North Korea. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the ransom note, well, I told you that's not necessarily a simple thing. Oh, actually, it was the fault of the NSA. They were the ones who discovered the vulnerability, built tools to exploit it, and it's those tools that meant that people could go and do bad things to our NHS. Oh, well, actually, it's Microsoft, wasn't it? It was Microsoft's fault, and because they shouldn't have had that flaw in their, in their software in the first place. Every device we buy, it's interesting, you know, you buy a washing machine, it doesn't work, you'd expect, well, actually, you would expect it to get fixed if it was, there was a design flaw. But software, we buy it, and it's broken all the time, we just don't know it's broken until people discover that, and, Often it's the wrong kind of people who discover that, that it's actually broken. Oh yes, the criminals. Forgot about those. When was the last time was that the criminals were the first people on our list uh, to think that actually maybe we should be doing something about them and preparing? 
So all of those lists, whose fault is it? Whose fault is it really when all of these bad things happen in our world of cybersecurity? Who is to blame? Throwing this question open, who's to blame? Okay, I shall point the finger. Yeah? What do you want? You've got your devices, you've got your phones, you've got your Macs, you've got your tablets, all of these lovely devices. What do you really want? Are you interested in security? No, of course you're not. This is what bothers you, isn't it? What's the other thing that, that really sets you on edge? Tell you what, tell you what, tell you what. You can have systems and devices which are cheap, fast, and resilient. Good offer, good offer. Tell you what, you can choose two. And in memory of the late meatloaf, what do we know about two out of three? Well, it ain't bad. It ain't bad, but you've got to choose what you want. There are constraints. Things come at a cost, and that might be time, it might be the content, it might be the, it might be the quality, and it's certainly going to affect the cost. So what do we expect? What is expected of you? You've got to go to work, you've got to go home, you've got to do stuff on these devices, and everything's now interlinked so we can click on stuff. Yeah, that's marvelous, isn't it? But the rest of the time you're being told, oh yeah, but you've got to look out for stuff. You're under pressure, time. These wonderful time sa labor saving devices so you can do so much fit in, the, fit in a day. Go to do two Zoom conferences at once with a microphone in each ear. Microphone in each ear, deliberate mistake. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's an interesting fashion statement. Uh, earphone, headphone, earphone in each, ear, uh, uh, in each ear. We expect too much from people. We don't actually think about where people fit into the systems that we built. And even that one single little device is a system. It's connected to other devices. It's got how many different bits of software and bloatware filling it up. So cybersecurity is absolutely everywhere. When it works well, it's like good writing. We don't notice it. We read it. And we read something, and that was good. If the writing is bad, we think, oh, I can't, can't be bothered with that. Or, yeah, I think I quite like that story. I'm going back now and reading some of the books that I read as a, as a teenager. And I'm finding that, yeah, the stories are brilliant and the concepts are amazing, but the writing is awful. Amazing what, what happens as we mature. And that's what we should be understanding and we should be maturing and realizing, yeah, it's not just about data. It's about the effects of that data. It's about the impact and the impact that ha that has on people. And it's only when you get a concept and a picture and a sizing of the impact that what you do has on individuals that you can get some kind of idea about how serious it is. Or are we like the car company? that when they heard there was a problem with the brakes, they started doing the calculations. Would they have to pay more compensation to the families of the people killed by the accidents? Then um, Would that be cheaper than recalling the cars in the first place? Yeah, it's, it's, we're in a Spider-Man situation. With great power comes great responsibility. So a quick crash course in all of this cybersecurity stuff. Yeah, we've got stuff that people like, that want and lasers that don't work, but never mind. So yes, we have information assets. Our systems, we decide we've got objectives, whether that's to run a power station, a water treatment plant, calculate somebody's wages or gas bills or whatever it might actually be. Our systems have objectives which they have to meet. And as a result of which, we need certain information assets on those systems. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which way you look at it, those assets have value. And those val that value is often attractive to other people who would like to have that value out of it. And so they are a threat to us because they may want to get their mitts on what we've got so that they can cash in on what we need to provide the products and services that keep our societies ticking over. And when they do, and when they're successful, and they will often do this by finding some vulnerability that perhaps we didn't even know about, or that we knew about but didn't, hadn't bothered fixing, that they have real-life impact on people. 
When I do these radio and TV interviews, quite often the presenter will go, ho, 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 so I suppose the only way to, to say secure is, not, is to switch your computer off. Well, of course it isn't. You're going to have to get the bank to switch off, the power stations, and all of these people who provide us these pro products and services in the first place who are using data about us to provide, not in a sinister way, but to enable our 21st century living. I nearly said 20th century there for uh, living. Maybe that's it. Maybe we're living with 20th century technology and the 21st century expectations. Uh, d discuss, perhaps. So yeah, so you know, if we can, so we can translate this, you know, from biscuits into real things, that tang almost tangible things. We talk about software and all of this cyber stuff being intangible. Uh, it's you know, it's a bit like the, the wave particle duality business. You know, moving along as a wave, but when it actually hits society, it's like a particle, and it actually does stuff. We have impact. People lose jobs. They lose their access. Sometimes we're doing better than, than, than we expect. And we do have things that we can do. And we can't stop. We've always got to keep running to keep up. Cyber, cyber, the word cyber comes from the Greek. And I won't try and pronounce it because I'm not, never very good at languages. But it comes from the original Greek word, word which talks about steering. It talks about steering. And Cyber led to the concept, the, I'm sure uh, it was mentioned, um, it mentioned briefly a moment ago, uh, mentioned last, uh, um, at, the, at the last road show, the idea of cybernetics. Cybernetics, the original science that our ideas of cyber came from. And there's a thing in cybernetics which is called the law of requisite variety, which essentially means with all of those problems out there, we're going to have to match those problems to be able to cope with those problems. And sometimes it will be people coping, and sometimes it will be technology, and sometimes it will be people and technology together. So it's confusing. And there are loads of guides and standards that we can benchmark against. You know what Tannenbaum said about standards? The nice thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from. So here we are with our water treatment plants and our power stations and our financial services and our road management. And we've all got different objectives depending on what it is that we do as part of our societal whole. So the most important thing that any system must do is it must operate, it must deliver our pensions, purify our water, supply our power. And we can perhaps think about wrapping around all of these good things. It would be daft not to protect it in the first place, but recognize that there are going to be systems. And to quote uh, Ian Levy, the technical director of the National Cyber Security Center, I think it must have been about five years ago now at a conference in Liverpool, he ended the conference saying, and this is the, this is the truth, that we need to be able to cope and manage with people that we don't want on our systems. So we have to cope with that compromise. So it means a really good, diverse community working together, not throwing it at the IT department, not thinking this is computer science, not thinking it's all about maths. Oh, yeah, we've got to encrypt things. The cyber essentials, which are recommended mandated in certain circumstances by the National Cyber Security Center, it's a bit like a cyber five a day. Just five things that you ought to do. But if you do those five things, that will protect you from 80% of the low-level automated attacks. And if you're protected from those, then you can get on and think about some of the more direct and targeted things. But you can work with the psychologists and the designers and the artists and they can establish what the real requirements are that we put into the systems already, not just to make the machine that goes bing and impress everybody. So if we can put these three things together, keep our systems operating in this cocoon of protection and self-preservation around them, sometimes it's the people doing it, sometimes it's the technology doing it, sometimes it's the people and technology together, then we can cope with cybersecurity. And I'd like to moot here, or suggest, that just as risk started with the concept of sailing off into the unknown, 
as we sail off into the unknown and release new products and services faster than something going very fast. I'm losing, running out of metaphors here. But the main metaphor, going back, sailing the seven, sailing the seven seas, people would have maps and they'd sail off into uncharted waters until they were chartered. They'd usually have, uh, be, here be dragons in certain parts of the map because the cartographers didn't know what was there. So they'd try and scare people off from going there in the first place. But perhaps we can isolate seven global requirements for everything we do to get the balance between the people and technology. If I'm working, I want this technology to complement my skills. It might be a bit of a sliding scale. I'm probably going to be tired and under pressure and I'm going to be an idiot. I'm going to drive back to Manchester and then I'm going to go to switch on my computer and try working tonight. So perhaps it needs to compensate for some of the things that I might do. Because these are going to be built into the devices that I'm using, I will have confidence. They will be trustworthy. Trustworthiness is nice. I will want to have a little bit of control. I mean, let's face it, let's face it, we don't like these computers to tell us what to do. We might want their advice, but we do want some agency, we would want some control over it. So yes, we want some co cooperation. But if I make a mistake, it would be nice. I mean, yes, you know, those, the, the, somebody applied for a job of, um, at one of the companies I'm involved with uh, a few months back and uh, he was re uh, rejected very early on, and he wanted to know why he was rejected, and said, well, you didn't get an interview because of all the mistakes in your CV. And he goes, what do you mean mistakes in my CV? Uh, there weren't any squiggly lines underneath it before I sent it in. So how much do we actually rely on, on these? But it's not just me by myself. If I'm just for myself, as Hillel said, if I'm just for myself, who will be for me? If I'm just for myself, who am I? And if not now, when? So it's that community, those different views. Not just from the point of view, a view of kind of technology or design, but just the fact that somebody might read from right to left and somebody else reads from left to right gives people different understandings of what, of what, of what, they're, of what they're looking at. And if you put all of these things together, perhaps we'll cope. People talk about an awful lot about this AI, this artificial intelligence thing. I think we actually missed one of the greatest opportunities. The reason why we're behind the curve on understandable, um, understandable uh, artificial intelligence is, again, I shall probably point the finger of blame. Who remembers Clippy? Yes. There was a software device, nice little animation perhaps, that tried to offer us advice, and it annoyed us. And rather than looking at the feedback and finding out how we might apply those seven C's to our word processor, what did we do? We killed off Clippy. And now we're worried because we've got oh, this, oh, these artificial intelligences, if we're gonna give it that label, making decisions for us. And, we're not, and it sounds good and it must be good because all, we put all this money and effort and expertise into it, but they don't even do the basic thing that we were all expected to do. What were we expected to do at school when you handed something in? You had to show you're working, didn't you? Oh, write in a full sentence. A few childhood traumas on low marks there. You can get to it. So one of the, well, a couple of the things that we're doing around this in, in, uh, in, in, in Manchester, I just thought be worth no, uh, noting, is we don't want people to wait until they're in a bad situation. And perhaps, you know, uh, sweeping things under the carpet, you know, rabbit in the headlights, too scared to talk, or worse, in a really bad situation. So we engage in exercises with adults and young people together, people with diverse backgrounds, cybersecurity experts, artists, parents, teachers, young people, to give them an, an emotional inoculation against the bad stuff going out, th going out there. But again, this is only part of the picture because there's a balance to be had, seven C's of technology and people working together in symbiosis. And the other side of stuff is normally when you go out to an SME, a small to medium-sized enterprise, and you talk about cybersecurity, there's lots of fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We've turned this around and we've created the Greater Manchester Cyber Foundry. 
and we take small to medium-sized enterprises on a journey where they can not only defend, but they can innovate and grow. And they do things that they wouldn't have thought of doing or have been able to do unless they build security into what they do. And that might be some kind of internal process. It might be a completely new product. So it might be growing the business in general. It might make you the, the, the growth of what makes the business strong and firm. So it creates jobs and protects jobs. And we're very proud. It's four universities working together. <laughs> the politics, good. Anyway, uh, the uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, University of Manchester, Salford and Lancaster universities working together to turn away this paradigm. So the second and final graph. All of this stuff happening out there in the world that we live in from cybersecurity. I was uh, um, out with some friends for a Friday night dinner. They had some other people there. And you know, go around the table, what do you do type of question. And I said, yeah, I worked in cybersecurity, hoping that we could move on very, very quickly. Because, you know, it was Friday night, it was me night off. Didn't want to talk shop. So he said, oh, cybersecurity. Yeah, I hear a lot about that on the news. So, Danny, are we winning? So, are we winning? Well, I think... It's true to say we are here. We are in a period of inevitable risk. But if you look at the bigger picture, you know, we can drink the water. The lights are on. Our phones are working. The traffic lights are changing. On the whole, we're probably winning. The problem is, is how we actually put that over to people and get their understanding and build the communities that we need to be able to maintain a safe and happy world of cybersecurity. Thank you. Thank you. Oops, I'm walking away. I'm walking, I'm walking away with the products. Um, I have a collection. Thank you. Um, that was really fascinating um, and a very good introduction to uh, the world of cybersecurity and uh, what we should and shouldn't be thinking about. So thank you, uh, Danny, for that. So um, next, we will be having a uh, presentation uh, Paul, from Paul Waller. He's not going to be here, but uh, we, we have a recording. And Paul Waller is head of research for the National Cyber Security Center, which uh, Danny mentioned. He has worked in crypto cryptogra cryptography and hardware security since graduating with a degree in mathematics in 2001. He's presented the NCSC and its predecessor organization in various standards bodies, sorry, represented, including the Trusted Computing Group, Global Platform, and FIDO. His current role as head of capability research allows him to spend time with academic and industry partners, learning what the future holds for security technology and also to help user communities to take advantage of new futures, features. So, I usually have problems with this, but let's hope this works. Good morning. Sorry I couldn't be here in person, but uh, it's great to have an opportunity to speak to you today. I'm Paul Waller, and I'm head of research for uh, the capability team in the National Cyber Security Centre. Those that don't know, the NCSC is the National Technical Authority for Cyber Security, and its mission is to help the, make the UK the safest place to live and work online. That means our remit expands uh, across protecting things like diplomatic and military communications, all the way through central government, uh, the education sector, and all the way into small businesses and individual citizens, cybersecurity. So uh, the remit extends across the entire country, uh, and we have a, a very wide range of different technologies and security uh, research that we're interested in. Here's an example of the problem we're facing today. Um, this cartoon is from uh, the well-known online comic XKCD. Um, and it always hits the nail on the head. Um, the world is really full of software in a, and hardware in an incredibly complicated interconnected system. Um, 
different bits of it turn out to be critical and are vital to the integrity of all sorts of systems around the UK and in fact around the world. Software tends to have vulnerabilities in it. These might be familiar to anyone who works in IT. Um, over the last few years, uh, a, a small number of software vulnerabilities have, have emerged in public um, and gained considerable press attention and indeed notoriety for the pain they caused to uh, network administrators, developers, and all kinds of people throughout the industry in order to, uh, to, to fix, uh, repair, deploy patches, and generally get systems back up and running again after they've been uh, affected by something like uh, Heartbleed is the one on the left. Um, you may also recognize uh, the Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities on the right there. You'd be forgiven for thinking that four or five vulnerabilities like this are the scale of the problem we're trying to solve. And actually the reality is, is significantly different from that. Um, these are the, simply the ones that, that, that garnered the most press attention. This graph is, is courtesy of NIST and shows that um, only the number of vulnerabilities that were reported to NIST uh, over the last few years um, split into severity in terms of low, medium and high. So this isn't the whole picture, but it's a representative sample. And the key thing here uh, is not, not the bit that's hidden behind my head, um, but the uh, the scale along across the left hand side of this graph. And you can see that the number of vulnerabilities reported to NIST is well over 10,000 every year since uh, 2017. So this is a volume problem. We're trying to solve um, the, the problem of vulnerabilities in, in systems like this at scale across the entire of our infrastructure. Um, it's not a case of just, um, just fixing them one at a time. How do we do that today? We have a range of good practices. We educate developers. We, we train people in how to spot these vulnerabilities, how to report them responsibly to vendors and vendors and how to fix them responsibly, deploy the fixes into operating systems. All of these things work, um, but they take time and they cost money. It's incredibly expensive for developers to maintain expert staff who can identify flaws and, and develop repairs and deploy fixes to, to, to systems around the world. So we need to stop patching things up with the uh, cyber equivalent of gaffer tape um, and actually fix the foundations. And for the purposes of this conversation, that means hardware and in some cases the software that runs right next to the hardware rather than applications that run on top. The uh, foundations of the digital world are the, the hardware and the processes that, that all of this infrastructure runs on. So what can we do to fix those foundations? Now I'm not going to describe the detail of the uh, technology behind the Digital Security by Design programme because there's other speakers today who are way better qualified than me to do that, but rest assured that um, we are working with some excellent research programs and uh, some uh, marvellous engineering companies who have the ability to um, design fixes at scale, fixing the problems at root cause um, in terms of, of exploitable vulnerabilities and trying to address whole classes of vulnerabilities in one go. That's great because we can come up with technological solutions that make our platform better and more resilient. But there's still a problem in terms of how we deploy those things and how developers get a return on their investment. How does somebody make more money by building a platform that's more secure? It's very hard to do in practice. And so there's an additional piece of work to get the mindset right, to get the incentives right in industry in order to encourage people to want to, to need to develop devices and, and platforms that are resilient against cyber attacks. This won't just happen on its own and that's why programs like digital security by design exist and it's why in addition to um, to industry uh, and, and and research and and the market forces on their own we need the uh, the additional insight of academic research uh, and and of government assistance as well to identify the long-term problems that need solving and create initiatives like digital security by design which is a partnership of of, of all three of those uh, those sectors um, in order to figure out how to fix these problems. And it's not just the case of the technological engineering fix, it's the mindset and economic fix of how do we encourage the ecosystem to take these changes on board and work with them, both at the hardware level, but also in the software tooling that supports 
making the best use of the new hardware and making it easier for the application developers to take advantage of the new technology. So here's an example of the sort of thing that we're trying to fix. The uh, buffer overflow is an example of memory safety uh, attacks where um, somebody can exploit the fact that the, the, uh, the, the checking the software does of its instruction pointer um, doesn't always work. Buffer road flows are quite an old uh, type of attack. In fact, they're so old, um, they're older than me. And, and this is kind of a good example of, of the complexity and scale of the problem we're trying to solve here. What industry in its right mind would have a systemic flaw at the heart of its products discovered in 1972 until deployed, still deploying and, and still being uncovered examples of it in 2022? 50 years later. This is evidence of market failure, which is only going to be fixed by everyone uh, working together um, in projects like this one uh, and providing opportunities to industry to, to deploy better solutions that are resilient from the ground up, in fact, secure by design. Now, there's opportunities in this. The uh, technologies on this slide are, are uh, uh, won't be uh, new to anybody. They're the the, the future of um, technological development, certainly in the UK and also around the world. We know we want to take more advantage of AI, of industrial IoT, uh, connected automotive and medical devices, um, connected places, or as they sometimes get referred to as smart cities, um, making vastly more use of a large array of connected sensors and data stores that can make us um, far more efficient in a whole range of, of, of walks of life. All of these technologies require confidence in the resilience of their computing foundations. If we're not confident that um, attacks can't undermine these systems and undermine the way we rely on them in our daily lives, um, we'll never be able to deploy them to their fullest potential. And so secure foundations, resilient foundations are essential in order to make progress in all of these areas. And that's why this program exists and uh, why I'm so excited to be able to speak here today about the benefits of it and the opportunities it brings to make progress in all of these areas and more. I'll leave you with this slide, which I hope emphasises that foundations are important and it's rather hard to fix them after the fact. Um, if we want to get this right first time and rely on uh, on resilient confusing foundations, we need to develop and use technologies that are secure by design. Thank you. Well, that's a very good introduction to the next talk, um, which uh, we're going to have from Professor Simon Moore, who's going to talk about a specific architecture, uh, technology architecture that addresses uh, what um, Paul was talking about. Um, so uh, before we go, go to uh, Simon Moore, uh, just a little uh, background. This, uh, Professor Simon Moore is Professor of Computer Engineering, uh, University of Cambridge, uh, Computer Science and Technology, where he conducts research and teaching in the general area of computer architecture. With particular interests, in secure and rigorously engineered processes and subsystems. So we're getting uh, right into the technology here now. He's a senior member of the Computer Architecture Research Group. The primary focus of Simon's research is the Cherry Secure Processor, uh, which is part of a full stack security project that includes RISC-V cores with Cherry security extensions and a complete software stack, including Computer Linker and full OS. That's all the de technical detail for those of you who do understand that. So he's going to talk about Cherry today, and um, uh, it, it is actually quite, quite an interesting uh, thing. I've written about this quite a lot. So Simon, over to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so my task is to give you a brief introduction to what is Cherry. Um, I'm one of a cast of many uh, representing various of my colleagues. We've been working on this since 2010, so it's had quite a bit of thought and uh, various sponsors. So, 
Uh, what is Cherry? Well, it's, uh, yes, we invented this name when we did the first grant bid. It's a capability hardware enhanced risk instructions. It's probably not very meaningful, but fundamentally we're trying to build new hardware and software technologies that fundamentally uh, mitigate security vulnerabilities, okay? And uh, as the introduction said, I'm, a, I'm a, an engineering background. And if you think about it in terms of things we expect today, I don't know, we expect bridges don't fall down, we expect buildings to stay up, and so on. These have been engineered. Over time, we've got better and better at building this resilient infrastructure. And what we're trying to do here is do the same sort of thing for computers, basically build something that's really robust, really solid, something that we can trust and rely upon, okay? So we've been working on this since 2010. Uh, we've been you know, working with uh, SRI International in California, and we've been initially thinking, how do we fundamentally change this? You know, forget what's been done before, how do we change the world? And this is kind of different from what uh, industry does. Industry generally does incremental improvements to make things better. So in a sense, what we did in 2010 was did this big grand thought experiment, and then we started to think, well, how could we um, actually move this into industry? And at that point, we started talking to ARM, and that went further. We managed to get uh, UKRR involved and the investment in this initiative. So in this talk today, I'm going to tell you about, you know, motivate it, uh, why develop Cherry. Uh, Paul's already given me some quite good motivation, so I'll skip through that quite quickly. Roughly, how does it work? Uh, you know, what software will be able to run on it? And what sort of evaluations have been done to date? So why develop Cherry? Well, as Paul said, there's things like buffer overflows. There have been known vulnerabilities or weaknesses in computer systems for decades. And uh, Ian Levy, you know, buffer over overflows, which are one form of memory safety vulnerability um, have been known about for over 40 years, and, uh, and if anything, the impact of these memory safety problems has just increased over time. So we need to fundamentally do something about it. Similarly, Matt Miller from uh, Microsoft's uh, Security Response Center said that of the order of 70% of all their vulnerabilities uh, in Microsoft codebase were memory safety, with the first place being spatial memory safety, and the other one being uh, temporal memory safety, so use after free. So these are sort of fundamental problems. So what we're aiming to do with Cherry is just completely eliminate these major uh, problems, okay? We probably won't, we're not gonna be able to solve absolutely everything, but if you can think about it, if we can solve 70% of the problems we've got today, that would be a really good start. So what is a memory safety vulnerability? Well, let me give you an example. So in a prior talk, um, Dave mentioned WannaCry, and that is also a memory safety vulnerability that impacted the NHS in particular. Heartbleed uh, was a vulnerability in uh, the secure web transactions. So you know, when you get a little padlock on your browser, um, you're running a HTTPS uh, using the TLS protocol, talking to your bank or whatever. Um, this was a vulnerability in that protocol. And this is a classic example where all the crypto and stuff, that was really robust. However, there was this little heartbeat message that was there to just sort of keep the link alive. And this XKCD comic shows this quite nicely. Oops. So roughly what this heartbeat message does is the, the client, so the web browser, says to the server, are you still there? Ugh, web browser, say potato. Six letters and the server says potato. Good, you're still there. Yeah, a few seconds later it says, are you still there? Because we're still talking to you. Oh, this time say bird, four letters, okay? And the server says bird. And then the client gets a little bit um, uh, too clever for itself. Uh, server, say hat. Oh, hat's 500 letters. And th this is kind of unbelievable and really rather embarrassing as a professional computer scientist, but what happened with this code is you asked the server to say hat, and not only did it say hat, but it gave you a complete 500 characters. And in that 500 characters included um, secret information that allow you to break into the system. 
I mean, this is just utterly stupid, right? I mean, it's, it's embarrassing, to be perfectly frank. So we have to get rid of these. So the classic answer is the programmer forgot to check the bounds on the data structure, and uh, there is a one-line fix for this. And this is what we do in industry at the moment. We find the vulnerability, we fix the software, we patch it up, and we keep moving forward. The problem is we haven't got to the root cause of the problem, so, which is what we're trying to do. So our answer is we actually want to preserve a lot more information that's in the code to begin with, because the programmer never intended to overflow or to buffer overread, and in fact, it's, in, it's actually in the data structures of the code. So in fact, with Heartbleed, if you recompile the code for Cherry, you completely mitigate the problem without having to know what the vulnerability was in the first place. So we preserve bounds information during compilation, and then the hardware, so I hadn't realized there were timings on this. The hardware um, of the processor dynamically checks those bounds very efficiently and with very little overhead. And it also provides various other guarantees around pointer integrity and provenance and so on. Another classic problem is the attack surface so, uh, what do I mean by attack surface? Well, it's how many points can an attacker get in? And one of the problems is that we tend to just build bigger bits of software. We use large libraries, the stuff just bloats. And the thing from an attacker's point of view is this code bloat uh, just makes their life easier because they've got more places they can prod. And it, you know, the, you've basically got more chance that there's a vulnerability in there somewhere. So the question is, how do we improve on that? Well, that's actually quite a fundamental idea in computer security called the application of least privilege. So what we want to do is software compartmentalization. So we want to decompose the software and put it in little sandboxes. And so, for example, if you've got a, you know, a, um, an email client, when you open up a message, you know, this is data that's come over the network. It might have things in it that are dangerous including images, you know, other attachments. All of those things we want to put in separate sandboxes. And if you do that, then you can really contain any possible problem. And this is actually really important because we know that if you can do this really well, it mitigates not only uh, known vulnerabilities, but it also mitigates unknown vulnerabilities and yet undiscovered classes of attack. Okay, so it's a fundamental uh, improvement. So basically, with this Cherry system, we want to uphold two principles. The first one is the principle of intentional use. We basically, we want to be able to run the software the way the programmer intended, so guaranteeing things like pointer integrity and provenance and dynamic bounds checking. And we also want to apply the principle of least privilege, so we reduce the attack surface, and this mitigates known and unknown exploits. And we want to make this highly scalable. So the question is, how do we do it? I'm going to whiz through this quite quickly, um, but just give you a bit of a flavor. We do make some additions to the processor. So we basically add a new type to replace pointers. So we add what's called a cherry capability, which is a bounds checked pointer with integrity. These are held in memory and, and in registers inside the processor. And actually, when you compile your code, uh, the compiler just used these automatically. With these, uh, we add to the address permissions, bounds, uh, an SBIT, which I'm not going to talk about, uh, which brings our 64-bit pointer up to 128-bit, so the pointers grow a bit inside, and we add a validity tag that's absolutely critical for security properties. And the basic idea with these things is actually relatively simple. If you've got a, some sort of data structure that's holding, like this message of, you know, this, you've just been sent this word hat, it's gone into a data structure, you know what the size is, and you, we now preserve those bounds, where that, previously that, those bounds information just weren't present to the processor, so it couldn't check them. So this is a very low level in, um, idea. We add this data type, and you have to remember when we build software that we build many, many, many layers. You know, in many ways, processors are quite dumb. You just tell them to do things like add two numbers together or 
fetch this from memory and put that in memory. And it's only because we run billions of instructions a second that it looks so clever, okay? So basically, this capability is right down at that low level. Uh, we've uh, added this new uh, data type and some new instructions. And in the hardware, in the microarchitecture, we guarantee certain key critical uh, security properties. And then on top of that, the compiler, the system software, and the applications, all the way up that stack, make use of this. And so the ideas sort of propagate all the way up. And there are actually many different ways, and in fact, we're still exploring the many different ways you can use these capabilities. Okay. And these primitives basically give us uh, an efficient mechanism to give very fine-grained memory protection. So as Paul Waller was saying, you know, mitigating things like buffer overflows, and actually very, at very low cost, uh, typically very low cost to performance, and yet you get all of these safety benefits. Okay. Uh, we also get very efficient software compartmentalization, which, as I've already said, allows us to fundamentally mitigate a lot of problems. So we've built uh, lots of things. We've built lots of different processors, experimental ones. We've been doing stuff with ARM, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Uh, we've been building up a software stack. So starting with a compiler and linker, so that you can just take existing code, recompile it. Most of the time, you can just take existing code, recompile it, and you get a whole load of benefits without having to do anything. It's great news. Um, we've looked at hypervisors. We've done work on operating systems, particularly around FreeBSD. Many of you won't have heard of FreeBSD, but you, probably a lot of you will have used Netflix and various other things. Netflix, actually, all, all of their servers run FreeBSD. Um, and so we've got a, a sort of cherry version of FreeBSD. Uh, and we've done lots of work around that. And working with ARM and Linaro, we've now got Linux and Android ports, although those are slightly less mature. And we've been working on open source uh, application suites, so KDE, uh, X11, you know, uh, for graphic stuff, WebKit, Python, and so on and so forth. We've also been throwing this technology over the wall already. So some early work that was done by Microsoft uh, Security uh, Research Center um, in the US. And uh, they had a really good look through um, a whole load of their vulnerabilities. And they, 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 what they were interested in is basically could Cherry mitigate vulnerabilities to the level that they wouldn't need to patch anything, okay? Because one of the things from their point of view is it's a big cost to them to uh, patch their software, ship it to their customers, and then there's also a big cost to their customers, you know, installing new versions of software and so on. Um, so they really want to reduce all of that patching. Um, they, did, you know, they wrote a 42-page report doing really concrete vulnerability analysis based on past vulnerabilities. And they determined that Cherry would you know, deterministically mitigate about two-thirds of these vulnerabilities, which actually is an enormous saving. Um, so that's great news. And you can find the report there. Another thing that's a bit of work that's been done actually under the uh, Digital Security by Design Initiative was done by Capabilities Limited. And uh, this was actually a, a fairly rapid study, three-month study, where they took uh, a desktop ecosystem. Uh, they, you know, this involved six million lines of C and C++ code. And they compartmentalized a whole load of, uh, sort of three applications. And the evaluation was kind of interesting. You know, Firstly, they only needed to change 0.26% of lines of code. So that's great. So a lot of this code, you just recompile it, and it works out of the box, mitigates all the problems. And also, they've got very high mitigation rate again. So that's just really good news. So where could you learn more? There are a lot of technical details for those who want technical details. There's a project website. Uh, there's an introduction to Cherry and more detailed stuff there. And the introduction to Cherry talks about, in more detail, about the architecture, the ISA, and formal modeling and all sorts of things. Let me finish up just talking a little bit about the work uh, we've been doing in, with ARM under this program. 
So um, ARM is, uh, for those who don't know, you, most of you will have ARM processors in your hand. Anybody who's got a mobile phone in their hand, you're using ARM processors because basically uh, ARM processors run on every mobile phone, every tablet. Uh, they're a UK-based company. Uh, their headquarters are in, in Cambridge. Um, they ship vast numbers of processors. They're actually an IP company, so they, they work with customers to produce chips. They don't sell the chips themselves. So unusually, uh, for this program, they've actually designed a chip, a demonstrator platform, and uh, in some sense, at first sight, this looks kind of boring because it just looks like any old computer. Uh, but the exciting thing is this new Morello chip, uh, which is basically all the cherry ideas on the ARM architecture. And on top of that, they've you know, built simulators, they've built the software stack up, all the tool chains and so on. And we're in the point where uh, these uh, the hardware and the software is going to be made, uh, made available to partners under the program. And what we want to achieve out of this is that people will take this and, yes, you could just run your code on it, and uh, what we would hope is your code would just work. Woohoo! However, what we're really interested in is people doing security analysis, you know, taking their code bases, uh, mapping it onto this architecture, and then looking, and particularly where companies know they've had pattern vulnerabilities, would this have helped? And that's the sort of analysis we want to know. It's also telling us quite a lot about, can you actually bring these cherry ideas to a real world chip? And that in itself is incredibly useful. So we, we want to get this hardware out there because we need to get the hardware out there so people can adopt it you know, incrementally. So I will wrap up. So uh, in Cambridge and with SRI, we've been doing working on this since 2010. There have been a lot of milestones along the way. And, and actually, kind of surprisingly for an academic project, we've done over 150 researcher years of effort, quite a few PhD theses, a lot of papers, uh, and actually a lot of uh, engineering effort from ARM over the last sort of year or so to do the Morello chip. Um, so to conclude, so cherry protections are completely deterministic and they solve fundamental security issues. Cherry provides hardware with more semantic knowledge of what the programmer intended. So basically you're more likely to run the program the way the programmer intended, not the way the attacker's trying to trick it. And it pushes us towards this principle of intentionality, okay? We also get efficient pointer integrity and bounds checking, and that eliminates buffer overflows, buffer overreads, finally. I mean, these things have been around for decades. We should squash them. They shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't be possible to have these in our systems. It also provides very scalable and efficient compartmentalization, and that pushes us towards the principle of least privilege so that we can uh, mitigate both known and unknown uh, attacks. And finally, of course, we're doing all this transition effort uh, with the help of UKRI under this program. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, that really sort of gave us uh, quite a good uh, detailed overview, shall I say, of uh, Cherry. So uh, th thanks once again. We're now going to turn to something a little bit different, um, uh, maybe sort of touching on some of the data aspects of things. Um, we have, we're pleased to have, Jude McCorry, uh, who's CEO of SBRC, which is the Scottish Business Resilience Center. She has over 20 years of experience in the technology sector and started her career with Dell Computers in Ireland and joined SBRC in April 2020 from the Data Lab where she was a director of business development, working with industry and academia to maximize the value of data for Scotland. We're going to hear a lot more about that, I'm sure. Jude, welcome you to the stage. Thank you, everybody. Usually at this slot, it's between myself and lunch, but I think it's between myself and the heat at this stage. <laughs> Sorry for it being so cold. I'm just taking off my jacket. <laughs> um, 
usually as well, whenever a presentation title is chosen for me, I, ch I change it, but uh, I didn't with Nula because I think it's a really good um, title. What got you here is not going to get you there. And I think for a lot of organizations in Scotland um, and probably around the world as well, what got us to this stage without being hit by a cyber attack is probably luck. Um, those who have been hit, it's pro they've probably been unlucky. I don't think, you know, the, the likes of the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency hit, the HSE hit. I don't think it's been targeted attacks. I think it has been more that they've been unlucky because they've been in that line of fire or cyber fire. Um, but going forward, we cannot depend on luck. Um, we, and I, I, my presentation is going to focus on the people side of things. We've heard a lot around the technology, but without the people side of things, none of this is going to work. Um, we, I think in, in Scotland, and I don't know if it's the same in, in down south, is that people in public sector are listening more to the warnings out around um, cybersecurity than they are in businesses. I think business people are probably burying their heads in the sand a lot more um, than public sector, and probably because public sector has been hit more in Scotland than, than, than the private sector, or it has been talked about more because the private sector kind of bury that as well, and they sometimes they pay the ransom and they just carry on with the businesses and uh, don't really want to talk about it and don't really want to share the intelligence or the learning of that attack. Um, taking over the role in, for the, you know, the first week of lockdown, I think it was, I haven't had that opportunity to sit in rooms full of people, so we've been doing all of our events online, and you, you kind of feel that you're just getting this like nodding dog at the back of an online event. But if you've got business people in a room, which we did last week, um, we had a big conference with the Royal Bank, and there was over 100, agent, 100 companies there, and we asked questions around, do you do cyber exercise and do you have an instant response plan? And we got that blank look of a room full of business people. Um, I think if we'd asked that to public sector, we would have, you know, I think there's a lot more focus from governments being put onto the public sector agencies at the moment. So what I want to talk about is a few different things that you can do around the people side of things uh, to protect the organisations. And we are working with uh, Scottish Government and NCSC around a cyber exercising programme. So we use the NCSC model, but we bring it to life. And we've been doing this online, but also we're starting to take this um, out to, the, to, to businesses. And we're doing some in Aberdeen and Glasgow next week as well, where people can exercise their cyber health in a, in a very um, safe way place with our ethical hackers and also with our head of ethical hacking as well. The other area that, you know, and that's a non-technical exercise as well, is for people in your organization so we're not relying on the technical side of things. The other area that I think we're severely lacking um, in education is around our boards and our non-execs and our CEOs. And we're not putting cyber as a priority on the, you know, your cyber risk register for the board. And I'm we, we did some um, non-exec training last year and some of the, you know, when I looked at the agenda, I was like, that's pretty basic. I, I, you know, I started off my career in Dell Computers and they send you on a very intensive five-week technology training course so that it probably, you know, the, the technology hasn't changed. We've got faster, it's got better, it's got probably smaller in some areas. But since I started my career, the technology is still the same. Um, but there's a lot of CEOs, there's a lot of non-execs out there that don't really understand the fundamentals, the basics of the technology, so they don't really know what risk they have within their organizations, and they certainly don't know how to, what to do if they were hit. So we're, we're trying to focus and get a lot more um, execs trained, and we're working with Kieran Martin, who was the CEO for NCSC, and he's coming up to Scotland next, or sorry, in May, the 5th and 6th, to deliver a two-day program and to take senior leaders through what they should understand, what questions they should be asking around the cyber health of the organizations, but also if they got that call um, during the night or in the morning that to say that they have been hit, what steps do they take and what, are they, what do they do to keep the, keep the organization as safe as possible. Stakeholders, shareholders, they don't really care that you've been hit by a cyber attack. What they care is that you're able to get the show back on the road as soon as possible. The other area that we've been talking quite a bit, and it hasn't had much of a mention today, but during Cyber Scotland Week, you know, I've been getting calls from journalists about, so what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, and oh my God, it's a big cyber war and stuff. And I'm like, well, it isn't. <laughs> um, for all the talk about cyber war, today just shows us when conflict escalates to this point, cyber is secondary. 
But that doesn't mean that there isn't a threat, you know, because w when Russia did try and do this cyber attack on the Ukraine, what they didn't think about was that people are actually in bunkers, they're in, you know, they're underground, they're in the train stations, there's nobody in the hospitals, there's nobody in the government agencies. So by doing a big wide scale cyber attack in a country that's under physical attack, it's not really working. But what we need to remember is that we've got all this cyber activity and we could be collateral damage. Cyber doesn't have any borders. We could have stray phishing emails ending up in our country. So we really need businesses and public sector as well to start looking at the cyber health of the organizations. Um, the other area we've spoken about it, and it's absolutely fantastic today, we're talking about something innovative, we're talking about something that can take away 70% of that risk, there's still that 30%, so we still need to be aware over the next few years as well, but we really need to invest in innovation around cybersecurity. We're far too reactive, we, we, we depend too much on people, we're not looking at the technology side of things around innovation, and we're not spending enough money in innovation. Um, particularly around cybersecurity. In Scotland, we are a very innovative nation. Um, we have invested a lot of money around the data science side of things. Um, I'm on the board for the data delivery um, initiative with Edinburgh University, and that's fantastic that we're working with data science. We're trying to get the value out of the data. We're trying to do really good things around data for good, and we're, we've got aspirations to be the data capital of Europe. But what we're not doing is protecting that data. I don't see the same conversations around, that's great, we've got artificial intelligence, we've got all this innovation going on, we've got a rob robotarium who's protecting the data on a, on a, on a Scottish scale and a UK scale as well. Um, some of the, the figures, when I was speaking earlier on, around um, what's been put into this Sherry project, as well as eye-watering for funding that we th talk about when we're in Scotland. So please don't forget about us in Scotland. Um, as partners, as collaborators, um, we are a fantastic nation. You know, the things like Cyber, Cyber um, Week, we've also got the Cyber Scotland Partnership that works really well because we're like this Goldilocks economy. We're not too big, we're not too small, we're definitely not too hot, especially today. <laughs> we are too cold. Um, but it works, collaboration works here. We know who the people are to talk and we've got people like Kira here has worked so hard around the cyber cluster and Scotland IS around building that cyber community as well. So please don't think, please don't forget about us and don't forget about the people side of cyber security. Thank you. So Jude, thank you very much um, for giving us that um, human perspective and uh, the issues on data as well. Um, so I'm uh, just going to take this moment to thank all our speakers this morning. That does bring us uh, to the end of the formal part of this morning. Uh, if you want to ask uh, the speakers any questions, uh, they'll be around. Uh, we have a networking and brunch. And uh, the next events in the series are next, next week. And um, just tell you a, a quick uh, little bit about them. So um, on the 8th of March, um, we'll be in uh, Newport in Wales and looking at, uh, spe speakers are going to be talking about how we strengthen the foundations and make the world more secure. So building upon the story we've done uh, in, uh, last week around the history and then uh, today about uh, some of the technology and how we do that. So that's um, on the 8th of March in Newport. And again, you have to be a hybrid, so uh, if you're unable to visit, it'll be there online, but also for those who are going to be there, uh, you know, please join us. And then on the 10th of March, it will be at the, um, uh, in Belfast, and uh, we're looking at the future for trusted computers. So um, yeah, that'll be now a little bit more sort of what's, what's happening next. So uh, once again, thank you very much and enjoy the networking, uh, both, uh, well, to our uh, guests here, uh, but also um, uh, we hope to see you at the next one for our uh, attendees online. Thank you. <laughs>